Hello and welcome to Rajya Sabha Television. You're watching The Big Picture with me, Frank Rao Zimbrera. Billions of children around the world are at an increased risk of online sexual exploitation, violence and cyberbullying as they spend more time on virtual platforms due to the closing of schools and COVID-19 lockdowns has ensured that more children are online. More than 1.5 billion children and young people have been affected by the closing of schools worldwide. Spending more time on virtual platforms can leave children vulnerable to online sexual exploitation and grooming as predators look to exploit the COVID-19 pandemic. On this edition of The Big Picture, we will analyze how to safeguard against online predators. Joining me on the program today are Dr. B.R. Gangadhar, Director, National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences, Bangalore, Niharika Chopra, Policy Director, Kaila Satyarthi Children's Foundation, and uh, Jitin Jain, Cyber Security Analyst. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on this edition of uh, The Big Picture. All right, Niharika, let me begin the program with you. Let's first try and understand and try and analyze how susceptible are children to online predators. I believe that your foundation has done a study on this as well. And why are children such easy targets? Right. Uh, hi, Frank. Thank you for having me here. And, and hello to all the panelists. Um, the, the study you're referring to is by the India Child Protection Fund. Uh, it had it has brought into mainstream the huge risk that children are at for child pornography. Now, that is both for children who are viewing child pornography, of course, but the research points out the demand for child pornography online. They conducted a research in December 2019 to find that within a period of one month, Five million searches for child pornography were conducted. This includes violent uh, terms of, of uh, child sex related uh, videos, which I will not go into. It's quite disturbing. Uh, but what it also brings into light is how it is a it is a problem within the entire country. There are a uh, hundred cities where this was conducted, and it is one. Uh, there is data from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, which is the largest clearinghouse of such images in the world, which says that between 1998 and 2017 alone, 3.9 million searches of child pornography were in India, which is a matter of national shame, in fact, for us, which, which brings into light that India is the largest consumer of child pornography in the world. And that is how susceptible our children are. I think, I think it is an underrated piece. I think it is around. Of course, as you say, as the pandemic has ended, uh, on us within homes, uh, a lot of non-fi platforms such as Pornhub, which is a popular platform, has made its premium content free, which basically has seen the since the pandemic there has been a 95% surge in 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 pornography viewership and a large percentage, I would say, 50 percent of that of pornography in general could be added to each other. The numbers are scary, and the vulnerability of children. Okay, all right. The numbers are scary, and the children especially are vulnerable, is what you're suggesting. Let me take what you're putting forward to Dr. Gangadhar now. You know, Dr. Gangadhar, how would you categorize uh, child porn addicts and pedophiles? Is it a mental problem? What is it really, and how can it be addressed? Yeah, there are... Uh two, three issues here. One, of course, uh, a generic one that it should not happen. That is one part of it. Second, a, a small proportion could well have this as a form of uh, either an obsession or a dependence. In this category of people who are either distressed or not distressed. Distressed that, you know, I keep uh, poaching into uh, all these uh, porn sites, etc. I am not able to hold my control on this, they genuinely need help and then they come and take help. And the other group of people are the ones who uh, want this to be controlled, but they are unable to make this happen. So together, this number of those people whom we may want to call it as illness is a very minuscule number. I don't want this phenomenon to be seen as an illness at this point of time. Although it has been described, more people who are offenders will take umbrage under this category. Oh, look, this is an illness. And I don't want this to happen. For the time being, most are not ill. Most are the ones who seek pleasure and they keep doing it. And uh, do all devious means to seek pleasure. And this is something that has to be controlled by law enforcement. And I don't think 
uh, it's a good thing to say that uh, illness is responsible for this behavior. This is number one. Uh, the second thing is, uh, I want to talk about gadget addiction as another agenda. Leave uh, porn addiction is one part of it. Gadget addiction. People, more and more people are getting addicted to gadgets such as cell phone or internet. Uh, this is uh, getting, uh, in fact, even the international professional bodies are recognizing this has to have become an illness. Uh, again, let me caution, gadget addiction of a non-criminal nature, it, it can keep happening. But once it comes under the criminal nature, to give a label of an addiction and an illness would be actually a disservice to those people who are getting uh, the uh, suffering because of this so-called addicted behavior. So gadget addiction is there. A good number of them are not poor. People are addicted for many other things, starting from gambling to watching movies to hundred other things. A proportion of them, of course, are into poor. And even among the poor, a very small proportion into this uh, pedophilic poor. Pedophilia is, of course, there is no question at all, there is a legally is a culpable offense. But I'm, what I'm trying to tell you is, Gadget addiction is something that has come to stay for various reasons. And to say that whether this lockdown increased people to become more addicts into gadgets is a far-fetched question. We don't have data at this point of time. Uh, time and again, most advisories, most professional people who spoke about how to manage your time during this lockdown period have uh, insisted that a lot of healthier options are there TV, internet is not just the only option. But mind you, TV, internet has actually made people become socially closer, although we use the word socially distant to keep ourselves away from this infection. But this actually has helped people to come closer. But should this be the only means is an issue which has always been debated. debated and I believe there are other means to have social connection. Okay, all right. Taking the discussion forward now, Jitin Jain, how do we safeguard children against online predators? See, uh, we would have had a different set of answers if this question was asked maybe a couple of months ago. Uh, you know, in, in on your show, we have discussed certain you know issues like what should be the right age of introducing mobile phone and gadgets to the children. Uh, how should a you know a parent supervise the children uh, if they are using misusing gadgets? Uh, how can you know uh, parents ensure that children don't fall prey to online harm like child bullying or harassment? Uh, but the problem with the lockdown is that a huge amount of population has been now forcefully, rather I would say we have no choice, has been forced to get themselves introduced to technology without any basic digital hygiene or digital awareness. Uh, most of the schools across the world are now conducting classes on Zoom. Now, this is not happening for the university or school children. This is also happening for, you know, children of small children uh, in the age bracket of 6 to 12, who are the most vulnerable category. Now, parents are left with no other choice. And remember, once you introduce technology and gadgets to them, even for this so-called online classrooms, it is going to stay forever. They will get addict addicted. So, uh, as Sir rightly said, that you know, uh, since uh, look at the figure of Zoom, which is now popularly being used, uh, their user base last year was 10 million, uh, and in the beginning of this very year, now they have got a user base of 200 million. So you are seeing a 20-fold increase of sudden dependence, and and then you know, once after the classroom, you have to give them laptops for homework and you know the other uh, thing you've given. Now in that segment. Uh, you know, there is a risk not only for this, uh, you know, child bullying and abuse, there is also a, a very accepted risk of uh, a very well known risk of unwarranted exposure in the form of advertisements which come on those websites. So, even if a person is not, you know, visiting a, the porn website, a lot of ads pops up, you know, and you will be surprised to know, even if you're watching simple YouTube videos, kind of ads which are popping up are so shameful that you can't watch them with the family. They are literally profane of porn sites. So I think government also has to look into that while we, uh, Ministry of Education, ask people and schools to shift to the online platform, first and the foremost thing we have to do is write to Google and Facebook, which are dominating 90% of the advertisement markets on the website platforms, to temporarily block all the profane ads for the next two months. I think that has to be done immediately. Rest of other issues like you know the child porn predators, we can deal with them. But this problem of unwarranted exposure, 
uh, you know, unsafe exposure of children to the online world and then, you know, just leaving them on their own without any defense or education, I think this will become the biggest risk in the months to come. Okay. Let's look at another aspect now, Niharika. Another aspect that I want to take forward with you is let's not forget that as Jitin has just rightly pointed out, there are more children who are going to be online now. Forget about the uh, children in the younger age bracket, but, you know, teens who are generally curious in that particular stage of their lives, they are online. There is very less parental guidance or parental control in a country like India. They could also be, you know, uh, sharing with each other when no one is looking some pornographic content. Now, that too needs to be looked at and that too is an issue, don't you think? Absolutely, Frank. It is an issue. And I would like to think that even though technology is here to stay, its misuse isn't. Uh, it will be in, in different degrees, but I would like to believe that children can be protected from the scourge of the internet. Um, when you're talking about children exchanging content over over the internet, of course, it's, it's, it's unstoppable. You cannot prevent children from using the internet. It has its benefits. I think what's important, one, is to speak to your child. It's important to understand the, the, the almost this parallel universe that they're living in and the kind of uh, content that they're viewing and their thoughts about it. That's one step. But also to understand that it is not just, um, it, it may be like children may be engaging in sexting or, or sharing of content which they're curious about, but it is a more organized uh, crime uh, in that, from that nature. It speaks of trafficking, there's extortion, there is the use of gaming platforms, social media platforms, and, and they're, they're very, there's very minimal accountability of these platforms. And, and of course, I agree with Jitain on saying that these internet service providers and the intermediaries need to be held accountable and made responsible for A, bringing down the content as soon as it's identified, having a proactive uh, identification mechanism, and also cooperating with law enforcement in the, in, 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 uh, the sharing of evidence and, and in, for investigation purposes. I think they have a key role to play because the burden can't be placed on the child or, or even the parent. It has to be those who are providing the service who have to take responsibility. Let, let me take what you're saying forward with, uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Gangadhar now. Gangadhar, uh, Dr. Gangadhar, you know, let's, let's talk about this issue and talk about uh, children as such, you know, children being exposed to pornography or children being uh, preyed upon and falling prey to online predators. How much of an impact does it have later on in their lives? How much of a mental issue is it, do you think? There are two issues here. Those who fall predators. Good number of them have had some such uh, sexual exploitation outside the purview of uh, internet. Uh, some adult in the family or somewhere in the neighborhood would have had some uh, mischief with them. And that stress is not well held or uh, uh, sorted out by the family members. Neither the elders in the family or the teachers would have heard them well and you know make their emotions lower on that issue. A lot of them they wouldn't even have divulged. So this is something that is burning in their mind. And some adult uh, you know uh, who is coming as a predator will broach these sensitive areas and they would feel like somebody is hearing me and they'll start narrating those things. So they'll, over a course of time, start becoming emotionally dependent on the other person and start narrating a lot of personal details. And it goes on and on and on. This is number one. Uh, this is something that uh, we need to be aware. The family members need to take into account the fact that if my child has had some stressful thing in the past, uh, which could be a risk factor for this child to be predated by somebody else. This is number one. So they have to be doubly careful. The second issue is all uh, childhood-related experiences which are very stressful, very traumatic, will have a longer-lasting effect. And it is known that many psychiatric illnesses have had uh, one of these as a contributory factor to adult uh, psychiatric illnesses. These two things, we, uh, we know it quite well. The third point, which uh, I'm sure the... Uh, all the internet service prov providers might have considered this, might not have been able to impl implement this. That is, if a child has registered uh, as an internet user for purpose of school homework or school teaching, etc., etc., or she wants to do a project for which she wants to browse the net, etc., etc., 
when a child has uh, been registered up to a period of up to 18 years as we know there should be a, a parallel registration of the either mother or father's website or the email address as well all these service providers they should be able to give a log of what all thing that the child has browsed to the parents otherwise the child has the registered the father himself would have registered the child for an internet site to look at the project work and after that he would have forgotten or the mother would have forgotten but if such browsing has been happening by the child some automatic alerting to the parents is a useful idea i'm very certain uh, world over people would have thought of this and uh, i don't know whether we have implemented this and as uh, it was rightly said in this next 2 3 year 2 3 months when you are allowing children to have a lot of internet access for school education etc etc we need to deliberately cut off some of the uh, sites and channels even if it is allowed for adult people okay interesting there let me take that particular point forward with you jitin you know uh, dr gangadhar there pointing out uh, the use of technology maybe you know at some level as uh, you yourself rightly pointed out in the uh, in your opening remarks about how this could be a new norm going forward considering that all this could take a while before it ends how big a role can technology play in trying to deal with the technological crisis well i mean technology would have a role to play but you have to choose that who will use technology so one choice is with the uh, you know online platforms like facebook google and the internet service provider to some you know sort of uh, uh, censor this uh, profane content or control this profane content or to build a necessary mechanism in place uh, especially child logs for example uh, youtube is offering child protection netflix has a child specific uh, column so that you know they are not uh, exposed to the unwarranted uh, uh, you know profane things uh, a second option is obviously which many people are uh, suggesting is to have some sort of surveillance in place on children you install monitoring software on mobile phones or laptops i personally do not agree with that because once you open that door uh, this will break away all the you know barriers which normally a child and parent has you know there are there are certain things which which you know which which are very personal and i think all of us have grown you know doing certain things making mistakes and learning from our mistakes but if that very barrier is broken if that very privacy is gone i think the relationship between parents and ch children will change forever so i'm not in a you know uh, i'm not in favor of uh, deploying child monitoring software but rather some sort of child locks could be deployed where you are able to ensure that only the content or with, uh, rather the white listed content are Uh, exposed to the children rather than the whole uh, uh, you know spectrum of content which is available online so i think instead of monitoring maybe the filtered con content could be made available to the children okay filtered content probably could be made available to the children that's the uh, that's something that we can see in the near future is what you are suggesting time now to get concluding remarks from all my guests starting first with you niharika you know uh, with the best way forward and on the role of the parents and parental control in dealing with all of this i think the entire uh, community and society needs to come together uh, to support families and parents uh, the government i think should run a very intensive online campaign on uh, the what child pornography is uh, what its effects are how to identify and report it these are all very important aspects and whenever a parent one uh, understands that a child may, may be seeing some content or maybe being used for some content they need to be able to speak to the child one but report it uh, and and that is the only way uh, deterrence can come about okay all right dr gangadhar what's the best way forward best way forward is to uh, facilitate uh, more uh, person to person interaction with the family members i am talking of in general gadget addiction which is we are advising a lot of family members the mother should be liked more than the tv screen to the child how we can help that possible uh, how much of interaction quality time spent with the kids is an issue which is a separate debate i think that is the central issue and you know since uh, uh, since you are director of nimans i must ask you this question you know as far as uh, this particular issue is concerned do you believe that at some level you know you need better family coaches probably or some kind of counseling for the parents and the children as a whole yeah actually uh, we have set up what is called as a, a clinic uh, a separate clinic for uh, both children and adults who have become dependent on gadget we call it as 
safe and healthy use of technology. That is the name of the clinic. We call it as a shut clinic. You shut all the screens. Uh, although the expansion is uh, uh, safe and healthy use of technology, and more and more people are availing this, we're going to uh, be preparing many more uh, professionals to be able to address this issue. We're going to bring some guidelines. This has been going on for the last two or three years uh, with more uh, data having accumulated. Now, we would probably be rolling out uh, some guidelines to teachers, to parents, and to all the internet service providers. Particularly from our social context of view, liberty versus some uh, restrictions, how to trade off, where are we standing, international laws versus Indian laws, uh, we are working on those protocols. So basically, you are suggesting that yeah, yes, yes, I'll come. I'll come back to you. I have another question for you, uh, Dr. Gangadhar. But yeah, but Jitin, yes, go ahead. You know, I think if if uh, Neman were to run our digital de addiction clinic, uh, you know, de addiction from gadgets, I think 50 percent of Indian population will land up at his door. <laughs> yeah, no, you know. So so basically, Dr. Gangadhar, are you saying that this is a reversible trend? But how difficult is it to get rid of this addiction? Do you think is it as bad as? drug or uh, alcohol addiction or is it worse or is, is there anything to su suggest anything yes, like sir, that? Right now, yeah, yeah, the impact of it right now, we have not had a good measure right now. Uh, we are realizing for the last five, six years, this is posing a problem. We are trying to find a solution. Maybe as a public health level, we need to bring in little more professional uh, advisories and professional uh, manuals as to how to uh, tackle this. Uh, we. Being a mental health institute, we are seeing it from a mental illness point of view and mental wellness point of view. But there could be many other factors which are operating, market, uh, politicians, uh, various other uh, groups which want to have this thing to be going on. So there are multiple uh, factors which are influencing this. Uh, we are trying to see how best we can come up with a capsule of uh, pa plan to mitigate this problem. Okay, all right. And Jitin Jain, close the show for us with your concluding remarks on the best way forward, really, as far as dealing with the uh, pedophilia is concerned. I think uh, one good idea would be uh, for, you know, uh, instead, before talking uh, these online classes and technology to children, the parents must understand and, you know, educate children about talking to them if they face any such online harm. You know, reporting it to the police. Make sure that it doesn't go unnoticed, unreported. Second, I think uh, uh, for many of us who are, you know, going to be online for the first time in their lives, uh, using these online classes. I think one good idea for all the parents would be to put the laptops and these uh, mobile gadgets in the public uh, public space of the home. So that, you know, while you are busy in other household activities, if the children is using mobile phone or uh, laptops or tablets, at least you can keep an eye on them. And also ensure that the screen is always visible to every member of family when a child is using Okay, them. all right. Absolutely. All right. On that note, then we call it a wrap on this edition of The Big Picture. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on the program and putting That's things right. into perspective for us. That's it from me. See you again next time.